Thank you everyone for being here. You're gonna judge me and that's okay. One of my favorite writers is Stephen King. And in his book series about the Dark Tower, he says, there are other worlds than this. And this is what I'm talking about today. When we think about African Americans in Soviet Central Asia, Soviet Uzbekistan, most people are like, black people, Russia, the Soviet Union, what? But yes, there are African Americans in the Soviet Central Asia, in the Soviet space in the 1920s and 1930s. Two worlds. One is Jim Crow. One is African Americans are legally segregated from their white counterparts. It's lynching, it's racial terror, and it's the Klan terrorizing African Americans throughout the American South. Sharecropping has distorted economic benefits. African Americans work dozens of hours a day for pennies. The flip side, the Soviet Union, the Druzhba Narodov, the friendship of the peoples. People across the world see the Soviet Union as this really interesting place or this really terrifying place. Either you think the five-year plan under Stalin is really fascinating, it's fast, super cultural change, economic change, or it's the greatest communist threat to the world. Both, maybe, maybe not. I leave that up to you. But what the Soviet Union represented to many African Americans was an escape from racism, from racial terror that impacted your soul, your body, the souls and bodies of your children. What does a future look like if it ends at the end of a rope on a tree? So when we think about African Americans who go to the Soviet Union in the 20s and 30s, we have to erase our ideas of what it meant to be a communist in the 20s and 30s, to really understand why they would go to this place, that while it's having economic development, also has a massive famine that will kill millions of Ukrainians and Kazakhs. So my research operates on a really dangerous premise now. I'm gonna say something that might get me arrested. Critical race theory, I said it. So. Here is my argument. Race is not biologically real, but phenotypic difference is. Another element of this, while race is not biologically real, it does have social and cultural significance, particularly in the United States in the 1920s and 30s. So this is our running assumption for this presentation. What I argue is that through the experiences of African Americans in Soviet Central Asia, we can understand the fluidity and contextual nature of race. What does this mean? How does this happen? Who cares? African Americans like Langston Hughes, one of the most famous African American and American writers, journalist Homer Smith, African American communist activist Louise Thompson Patterson, they all went to the Soviet Union in search of something different, another world a world free of racism, a world free of racial terror, a world that gave a different look at what the world could be without capitalism. Here are the two main factors that kind of join together African Americans and Soviet Central Asians, particularly residents of Soviet Uzbekistan. One, as you can see from this picture, cotton. The tactile idea of cotton. Cotton conjoins Soviet Uzbekistan and the American South. But what Langston Hughes pointed out, it was very strange and surreal to see people just as brown as he was picking cotton for themselves. There was no overseer. There was no white landowner who would take their money from them. What does it mean to pick cotton for the Soviet Socialist Uzbek Republic versus what it means to pick cotton in Alabama? Langston Hughes points out all the children in Soviet Uzbekistan were in school. They were not in the fields. And he remembers how in Mississippi, when it's time to pick cotton, African-American children are not in school. They're in the fields, being robbed of their future to produce for American capitalism. Another element we see in this picture, besides cotton, is this idea of a shared oppression. Journalist Homer Smith was good at this. He, I call him the scribe of black Russia. He's a journalist who left the United States shortly after the Scottsboro trial because he knew as a black man in his early 20s, the United States was dangerous. 
So he finds himself in the Soviet Union and he writes for African-American newspapers and he writes headlines like this, Black Shepherds of the Omar Khayyam Land. He describes Uzbeks as swarthy people. He calls them the Blacks of the Russian Empire. Why is this important? Because beyond shared phenotypic similarity, our skin color, beyond the tactile similarity of picking cotton, we have this idea of a history of shared oppression. And this is why the black press is important. Because writers like Homer Smith, Loren Miller, they're writing to a public in America, a black reading public that understands racial oppression, that understands economic oppression. And this is the history he creates. And this isn't out of thin air. Throughout this, the Russian imperial period, Uzbeks were treated as different. They were often segregated from their Slavic looking counterparts. They had to pick cotton, but saw no benefits from it. So when Homer Smith is writing to African-Americans in Alabama and Mississippi in 1932, they fundamentally understand when he says that during the Tsarist period, the Uzbeks were Jim Crowed. Everyone in the United States who was black knew what that meant. Another fascinating person is Louise Thompson Patterson. Unfortunately, throughout Soviet history, and particularly African-American experiences in Soviet history, black women are often left to the wayside. There's not much in the archives about them. But this woman, without her, there is no African-American trip to the Soviet Union to create an anti-racist film called Black and White. The film is canceled, we aren't quite sure why. Probably Stalin, it's usually Stalin. But she organized this trip. She got the funding together. And she went to Soviet Uzbekistan and she met and spoke to Uzbek women who had recently unveiled, who had left abusive husbands, who finally had access to education. Women who were in many ways for the 1930s liberated. And this black woman thought about black women in the United States who had no right to an education, who had no right to vote, who couldn't lead integrated social and political groups. But she saw that in Soviet Uzbekistan, and she wanted that in the United States. And it fundamentally shaped her activism when she returned to the United States. So what about these lives? Why do these black lives matter? Because they show us race and the American understanding of race is not the only way it functions. Throughout history, particularly in the Soviet Union, when it presented itself as racially neutral, African Americans saw alternatives to both capitalism and racism in the United States. So I remind you that there are very much, in fact, other worlds than this. Thank you.